Hi, I'm Michelle Pelazon, your host and the head witch in charge here at Holisticism, coming to you from blustery, <laughs> hurricane East Coast. I am so delighted for you to listen to this week's episode. I had the absolute pleasure of interviewing Ali Maz. Ali is a yoga teacher, breathwork teacher and guide, a teacher at Open, and the creator and CEO and founder of Girlvana, and also the author of the book, Girlvana. And ugh, the first time that we took class with Ali, we, we took class with our CUSP members. If you're not part of the CUSP, what you doing? Get in there. And we did a debrief after because we were actually reviewing Open. We weren't sure if we were going to like it or not. So it was one of the first products that we reviewed, and it turns out we liked it. But we did a debrief after with our members, and there were probably, I don't know, 50 people on the call. And everyone was like, I think I just fell in love with Allie. <laughs> and she's so lovable, so delightful, so fun. She's such a great leader for girls, and probably why she's so passionate about what she does with Girlvana, because she's so real. She's such a real person. Ali and I have a little bit of a past that's some, somewhat similar. We both were in the dance world and had disordered eating because you can't really be in the dance world without that. I, I don't think, I think it's really hard to navigate away from. And we both fell into wellness and well-being and sort of found a safe haven for our disorder and dysfunction to sort of hide dysfunction behind the guise of wellness. And I, I think a lot of us do this. I think a lot of us find wellness because it gives us permission to, I don't know, lean into our anxieties or our disordered behaviors or patterns or our self-harm patterns and actually call them discipline or call them well-being or call them health. And hopefully, eventually, we find a way out of that and we stop using wellness as a shield and we actually allow it to be a thing that lets us soften into who we are and give us more empathy and grace and compassion for ourselves and to not be so perfect. But I really resonated with Allie's story and I think that you will too. And just her evolution as a teacher and a practitioner and why she was so passionate around creating Girlvana and writing this book, Girlvana, that she's been working on for the last five years. We talk about, you know, the ups and downs of that and how it wasn't easy and how it's kind of depressing when you come to the end of a big journey like that. And what are you supposed to do with yourself? And how do you also keep your vision as the world changes so much, as you change so much if you're working on something for the long term? So whether you're someone who's committed to their own self-growth and spiritual practice and just self-loving practice, not to sound totally cheesy, but like, accepting of yourself and who you are. Arguably, that's why you're here, right? You're like a God on earth <laughs> with all this consciousness and all this, you know, information stored away that you're just sort of digging in to find and rediscover and re-remember the divinity of who you are. I think that Ali's story is really incredible. And we also talk about how healing is a spiral and we really have to go through it on our own in order to learn really big lessons that are really painful and as easy as we want to make it for others. Sometimes all we have to do is just give them the dignity of their own timing and what that looks like as a teacher, as um, someone who's a mentor to young people, as someone who's on their own healing journey and in relationship with other people, right? How can we give people the dignity of their own timing and also help them? <laughs> and that is not an easy ledge to walk. <laughs> so this episode's really great. You're going to fall in love with Allie and you should absolutely take her class at open. She's phenomenal. She's such a light and I cannot wait for you to learn more about her. So without further ado, here's Allie. Hi, Allie. Hi. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you on the 12th house. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of you. I'm a fan of the podcast, all the work that you do. So this is exciting for me. Well, it's very mutual. I remember we, taking your class for the first time and we have a bunch of friends in common, including one of our mutual friends, Sneaky Way. And I remember taking your class the first time and with the whole cusp community. So there are like 150 of us or something. And everyone afterwards is like, I think I have a crush on Allie. <laughs> <laughs> that's very sweet that's very sweet I remember that class I loved having you all in there and yeah that's very sweet I was gonna say I have a crush on everyone too but I don't think you can say that as a teacher <laughs> like a platonic crush you know like yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. very safe Mutual, healthy yeah. relationship yeah <laughs> very safe consensual you recently published a book 
And on a scale of one to giving birth to a child, what was that like? It's giving birth to a child, I think. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've never given birth to a child, but friends of mine who have given birth to a book and a child have said it is that you, it, it is that process. It's, it's incredible and it's painful and it's vulnerable and it's raw and it's terrifying and it's sort of all all of the above. And if I'm being totally honest, it's been two months and I actually feel like I have postpartum depression. Like I, mm, I'm yeah. feeling sort of there's this high moment and then it's like, well, now now what? So yeah, I'm kind of in that downswing if we're going to use that sort of metaphor comparison. And but yeah, it's been a wild ride. I wrote the book. I mean, I've been writing the book. It's been living in me with me for the past five years and now the world gets to have it and I you know there's some identity loss in that and there's yeah it's it's cool and it's scary had you been like writing it sort of passively like as journaling or, or blogs or putting your ideas somewhere this whole time or was this like oh you got the book deal and you're like all right I'm gonna sit down and, and write right it was kind of happenstance friends of mine were writing a cookbook I'm Canadian and was living in Vancouver and they introduced me to the VP of uh, Penguin Random House in Vancouver. And they said, hey, this is Robert. He'd love to have a coffee with you. And I thought, okay. And we just chatted. And, and I have had this company, this program called Girlvana, which empowers self-identified young women through the practices of yoga, meditation, and conversation. And we just sort of chatted. And he said, do you think this is a book? And I said, yes. I do. But in my mind, I thought it was something I would write, you know, like on my dying day, like after my whole life was said, <laughs> not at, you know, 29. And so I said, yes. And he said, great. Take some time to write me an outline. And then two weeks later, I had a book deal in my hands and I, I, I was wild. So then I thought, okay, amazing. I don't actually know how to write a book. I love writing. I love journaling. I was blogging and doing things like that. But it took me a long time to carve out what the book was actually going to look like. And and over the, the course of those five years, it wasn't like I was sitting down to the book every single day. I was I had a yoga studio that I owned. I had retreats that I was doing globally every year. Like I was busy. So it took me a long time just based off of that. And I think that things slowed down, obviously, with COVID and and it changed the direction of the book, too. So definitely was something that was sort of always floating above my head the last five years. Of, oh, what about this? Or I want to change this and working close with my editor, Bhavna, until it was out in the world. Wow. And now, so you really have been working on it for five. That's a huge ending, like closing to a chapter. Yeah, I think that's why I I, went, I was like, okay, bye for now. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Anyways, I'm, not, I'm just going to put you on my shelf, I guess. So <laughs> Yeah, it just stares at me from the shelf. I'm like, I don't know. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm so lucky to know so many like amazing people who've written books on a span of subjects and topics and they all approach their sort of writing and the promotion of the book so differently. And I'm sure that also depends on the publisher and the team behind you. you no know, one person who, you know, wrote a book probably seven years ago and she talks about it like every single time she's on a podcast and re really regularly. And I'm sure she still sells a lot of this book. And then there, I have other friends who've written multiple books that they never talk about, you know, like it's just so interesting. Yeah, I think the cool and scary thing is that it lives forever. What you wrote <laughs> yeah. is yeah. crystallized forever, which is cool. And it's an interesting thing. And I, I, I feel really grateful that it lives in this capacity. And I think that I'll get over myself. I think I gave myself till August to get over myself. And I just can't even bring myself to post about it. I just like, I'm like, ooh, it just feels a little tender. And so once September hits, I'm going to get the ball rolling again in terms of promo and pushing because it's so weird you live with this book for so long and then your job is to be a promoter mm -hmm. essentially and and that's a weird thing it's something I've always grappled with I've been in the wellness industry for 15 years I've been teaching yoga since I was 20 and I'm like can I just do the thing that I love without having to talk about it all the time and it's <laughs> like you can't if you want to make a living so mm -hmm. I'm constantly in that dance and I'm sure you are too of, of you you make the thing, you do the thing, you love the thing, and then it's the constantly kind of trying to share it and, and get people involved in it. And some days I like it, and some days I do not want to be in the world like that. I hear you 100%. And I think when you're like, I don't know about you, but when I'm making something, I'm so 
I'm like so ADHD. I'm so hyper focused on the thing. And that's worked really well for me. It's like, you know, why I, I, I can do what I do. But by the time it sometimes comes to like tell other people about it, I'm like, I've lived with this thing 24 seven for like the last six months. I'm so bored of it. Like I'm so tired of it. It's amazing what I've built, but like I'm exhausted and, yeah. and yeah. no one's seen the behind the scenes version or like immersion that you've been in. So it seems like you drop the ball or you're afraid to talk about it, but it's more just like, it's boring to me now. Like I've, I've like beat this dead horse and I'm done. Yes. Yes. No, it's very real. That's very real. Thank you. I feel valid in that expression. <laughs> it's like you sh- it should feel really exciting. And there are elements, there are elements to it that feel really exciting. And then sometimes it's, it's just not as exciting. It's, mm-hmm. it's yeah. Because Girlvana is such a beautiful digital platform. Does it kind of make you wonder about if you'll do physical products like this in the future? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely time consuming. I think I would hope that with the next one, I know I have another book in me. I do feel that way, even though this has been so challenging. I'm like, I know I'm going to do this again. But what I love about it is that it's really in the creation process. What took the most time was just format and really understanding. I mean, the book reads part self memoir of me as a teen. And then I, I tell a story about a girl, which is essentially an amalgamation of girls and the past that I've worked with. And then it's rooted in a, a yogic principle. So the first chapter is the himsa nonviolence. We talk about mm-hmm. self harm and we talk about eating disorder and we talk about ways in which our mind harms us, our thoughts harm us. So it's sort of rooted in a yogic principle. And then it's broken down with a breathing exercise and meditation, a little yoga sequence, and then a journaling prompt. So each chapter is like its own little workbook. And that was important to me because Girlvana is so much more than a yoga class for teenage girls. It's, it's, it's so much more than the physical and we go way, way deeper into these bigger conversations around consent or sexual experience, periods, um, parents divorcing, breaking up with the friend. We really cover the coming of age in a big way. And so I was like, how do I, how do I do this? How do I tell that story in book form? And so to me, it was like, creating trust from here, my own experiences. And then I know I have one experience in this body. And so I wanted to share other experiences from, from a teenager's point of view and then root it in the lesson, the learning, and then the practical kind of action around it. And so the book kind of moves from the sort of more dense to the subtle. So we kind of move from the body into the mind and then into the heart and then into the spirit. And then really it's about the call to action of how, you know, this yoga thing is not just about liber- liberating yourself. It's about liberation for all. And so there's really like a, a raw, like a rally call at the end of the book of like, let's, let's go out and do this work. So, but figuring out how to do that it was hard. And I had a really incredible editor, Bhavna, who is just wonderful. That really helped me carve it out as well. That book sounds amazing and exactly what I needed when I was in, in my teens. But I'm thinking about how, when you probably started writing this five years ago, just how much the digital landscape has changed for teenage girls. Like, holy shit. When we look at Instagram filters now, like just the level of digital dysmorphia as if it wasn't complex enough to just be a person, right? Coming of age with a body. Now we have all this extra ephemera layered on top of it. Yeah. How did that come into your creation process? And how do you take into consideration this quickly moving landscape? Yeah, it's such a great question. And that was really the question from the beginning is like, how do you write something that feels of the moment Mm -hmm. and timeless? Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) How can this book 10 years ago not feel ancient? And so I was really careful even in the usage of saying Instagram, because maybe Instagram's not going to be the platform in five years, you know, like, look how fast Facebook became this like chuggy thing. Or MySpace. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, and when I started writing, I was writing for, for younger millennials and then it shifted into Gen Z. When I started writing, Trump hadn't become president yet. Oh School gosh. shootings didn't look the same way. COVID wasn't a thing. We didn't, we weren't seeing the social landscape just shifted so, so much. And, and I'm so grateful that I waited because originally, I was sort of asked to write like a cutesy teen girl's guide to yoga, you know, and I could have done that. I could have made that book really, really quickly. You know, we could have had a little kelp smoothie recipe in there. We could have been real cute. But instead, I wanted to talk about privilege and oppression and race and cutting and like real stuff. And the first draft 
penguin was kind of like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> like, so you're so you're radicalizing girls here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're like, not what we thought. And I feel really grateful that I had a team behind me that really was like, okay, let's go back. Let's let's do. You want to write this book? Let's write this book and let's figure out a way to write this book so that people can really hear it. And and so I think that, I mean, when you and I were in in you know high school, we had to like walk to the corner store and buy a magazine and like open a page and see an image Mm -hmm. of someone that was going to make us feel bad. But there was like a little bit of effort there, like turn on the TV and like wait till 90210 comes on or whatever. So right now it's so different because it's at your fingertips. You're constantly seeing images and then you're constantly, you can actually go into your Instagram story, flip on a filter and then see yourself looking like that image. Like it's truly so distorted. Um, and I, I think where the line is with young people is being careful to not go, oh, in, this is so stupid and this is harmful and, you know, this is bad and wrong because it's mm-hmm. their world. And so it's it's opening up the dialogue more so not this is bad, but how do you feel when you see these images? What do you feel when you slip that filter on? What's going through your mind? What does it feel like in your body? And so it's more of an exploration, getting young people to explore it versus saying, no, that's bad and that's wrong. And. I didn't have that. Thank God I didn't have that growing up. Like they're like, okay, cool. Well, I do. So that's not helpful. And so I think it's really just an exploration around how does it make you feel and why. And young people are so much smarter than we think they are, truly. They're so um, tapped in, dude. Like they, yeah. they just like understand concepts that I, I feel like our parents or like my parents, the idea of gender is it's a struggle man for them like they it's been a struggle for the past couple of years that we're we're trying to push push through and young people are just like yeah they're bin- they're non-binary whatever yeah. next next yeah. question like they just understand totally. it it's like they don't yeah. need it to be taught to them it's so cool it is it's really cool it's so funny because I, I mean, I've always taught adult, adults and I've always worked with teenagers. And so when I, and when I would lead Lady Vana, like the grown up version of women's retreat and we, everyone's like, well, what's the difference? I'm like, it's the same information, <laughs> so like, but don't you have to like dumb it down for the kids? And I was like, no, actually they are more advanced. Than us. <laughs> and they have less like clouding and conditioning. And mm-hmm. that's what I love so much about working with young people is like, They've had less time for life to really like harden them. So mm-hmm. to, to kind of pull apart a little bit and, and, and speak about some of these practices and talk about self love and talk about what it is to honor yourself, have a relationship with food and body and all of these things, but it's easier actually because they can kind of shed some of those layers quicker. And I've seen because I've been doing Ravana for 10 years, like I have girls that are 24 that I met at 14 and I've been mm-hmm. able to see the progression of their lives and the choices that they've made and, and, and her, her heard firsthand you know these stories of really seeing young people in these crossroads and and watching how the practices of yoga and meditation and, and true sisterhood has allowed them to really be these like fully expressed human beings that are like light years ahead of where I was at that age that's so cool wellness is like this double-edged sword right where we can sort of hide behind the helm of wellness a lot of disordered thinking and action and even like sort of tenets of capitalism self-improvement for for some ultimate goal of being more productive or making more money or being more good looking or whatever it might be accepted by society how do you frame that up for them that it's not about like you suck and you have to improve yourself and you have to always be improving yourself that it's it's not about that because i think that a lot of people in wellness don't get that (laughs) you know Quick little break for our sponsor, Open. Open is a digital mindfulness studio for everyone. And I was kind of expecting it to be like every other digital mindfulness app and meditation app out there. But when I logged in for my first class, it was honestly like nothing else I'd ever experienced. It was a phenomenal experience. It is so unexpected and delightful. And it's also a beautiful background experience the vibes and the aesthetics are immaculate and it makes you feel immediately like oh i'm in the right place i can breathe classes are available in the open app and on the desktop there are fresh classes every day so you can take on-demand classes you can take live classes you can get started with your meditation or breath work or just 
morning self-care, afternoon self-care, whenever you want self-care routine, and you get your first 30 days for free when you join using the code holisticism at checkout. We'll put a link below in our show notes. So if you want to meditate with us and really take advantage of that group sesh vibe, it's really fun to meditate together because accountability. But you just got to try it. Truly go look at it. It will blow your mind. And I can't wait to hear what you think. So I'll see you in class. I agree. I <laughs> strongly agree. I start the book. I think it's the, again, I haven't looked at this book in a long time. I'm like, I think I wrote this in the book where I thought, I thought that yoga was for like the white women dressed in all white and wearing mala beads <laughs> to TK. I'm laughing because I'm dressed literally. <laughs> Headed to white, but she looks flawless. You know, walking out of expensive yoga studios in Santa Monica with their green juice. And I, I, I lived in Los Angeles to pursue a professional dance career when I was 18. And I was really surrounded also by by yoga and sort of the inception of this wellness world and raw food and veganism and all of these things. And I just sort of looked at that as a a teen, late teen, young woman thinking like, do I want that? Am I supposed to be that? Is that for me? And really questioning it. And I think I dove headfirst into those practices and became a raw vegan and uh, was practicing a ton. Yeah. And I, what I know about that experience, I read a lot about this in the book is that for me, veganism and, and, and especially being raw and being on a juice cleanse, that was just another form of my eating disorder. And it just mm-hmm. looked different. It was still a way for me to control because what I know about my own eating disorder and what I know about food for me was always about how do I control? I'm feeling too much. I'm the sensitive human being in the world. I'm like receiving it all. I'm feel out of control. How do I control this? It's going to be through binging, purging, or limiting my food. And so when I came into the wellness world, I was like, oh, sick. Like, this is awesome. I can just be on a juice cleanse and no one's going to be on me. Like, it's, <laughs> it's healthy. And yeah, yeah. No one's going to be on me about over-exercising because it's yoga and no one knows enough about it yet. So I can really get away with a lot of the patterns that I had learned from growing up in really a toxic dance studio and a dance culture, which I know you understand too. And so I was in, I was like bought in, I could just keep doing all of the patterns and doing all the things. But the beauty of the yoga practice and even if you're like with some whack teacher or, you know, that the, the postures are medicine and the practice itself will reveal. And I always say like, what's false will fall away. And so I started studying one direction, but it led me deeper. I want to know more until I started to find some true teachers. And I write about this in the book to my eating disorder and how I did that. Something I say a lot, especially to the girls is like, you're not a problem that needs to be solved and you're not broken and you don't need to be fixed. And really the aim of these practices are always about a remembrance of your wholeness. Mm. And so if anyone in your life or anything is making you feel like you have to keep coming back to get the thing to be whole, then it's not the right thing. Your yoga teacher, your best friend, your partner should make you remember your wholeness and and guide you back home to yourself. And so I was practicing with some some false idols there for a while, but ultimately it led me down a path where I found some true teachers. I really struggle with being in the wellness industry because I'm just so in fear of just by being a white woman, able-bodied human being, that I'm going to perpetuate harm on some level or that people will see me from the outside and go like, yikes that's everything I hate about the wellness industry Mm -hmm. and so I do I struggle with it all the time appropriating these practices and I'm I'm constantly in this conversation in my own head but then I sit down with a bunch of young people and we have conversations about what it is to be human and we breathe together and we move our bodies and everyone feels better at the end and we all remember who we are we go home and I think well I I gotta be doing that (laughs) it's what I'm here to do so Yeah, I think what's important to know is that, you know, the wellness industry is all of those things. And there are some real people out there teaching some real things that care about you and that care about you refinding you and coming home to yourself. And that's the reason I do it. Yeah. Uh, What I'm hearing is that you, you hold the structure, but you're someone to find that true path. You trust in the dignity of someone else's timing. And I feel like a lot of people who enter the wellness space and who really want to change it because maybe they've 
had the same experiences. I feel like you and I had basically lived the same life, right? They've had these same experiences and they're like, I want to make it easier and better. I don't want anyone else to go through that. I want, I want them to find exactly what they need right when they enter wellness and like learn the lesson and become whole. And that's so well-intentioned and it also isn't really the point. Like the point I feel like is the struggle through it, right? Like, yeah, we don't, of course we don't want people to be harmed. Of course we don't want them to like stay in a, a situation or relationship with their body or themselves. It's, it's not like optimal, but also sometimes you have to suffer through it and that's how you actually learn and you take in the lesson. And yeah, I just love this idea of trusting the dignity of someone else's timing, giving them that space to find it on their own and not forcing them to come to some realization and it can be really hard (laughs) oh it's so hard and ultimately once I started to pull away more as a student and became a teacher and was practicing a lot on my own and not so reliant on someone else telling me I was like oh there it is there I am right I mean we're doing this work to realize that we are the teacher where we have an inner teacher an inner guide and in particular, I think it's hard for young people because they're just little and they're just like, you know, like figuring out the world and you just are like, oh, it's so hard and I want you to be okay. But ultimately, it's how I feel when I teach. It's how I feel with the book. Like, here's some tools. Maybe something in here is going to resonate with you. And with young people in the moment, I mean, God, I used to teach in high schools, like 50 kids, 10th grade, PE bringing schlepping all these mats from my car and trying to convince like people in like 2010 that yoga was cool and And, you know if one kid at the end of that class you know would come up and just be like wow thank you then I was like I did my job and you don't know what kind of seeds you're planting you don't know like there's so many times that people aren't going to tell you Mm -hmm. but I just sort of trust in the, the work and like you said the container and you know people will find their way And sometimes it's years later, like I've had, I've taught kids at age 15 and then they show up, you know, a few years later at my yoga studio in Vancouver, like you came to my soccer practice and taught yoga and I'll never forget it. And so you just never know the impact. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it's true. As a teacher, you have no idea what is going to resonate with someone in a good way and a bad way, right? Like one sideways word or offhanded comment, like that might stick with someone forever. And like, you never know when that piece of knowledge just drops into someone's consciousness. It can be years later, like, right? That that the the dignity of their their own timing to come to it. And they're like, oh, I actually understand now what that meant yeah and it's so interesting what people hear because I think often when I'm teaching I mean I teach almost every day I'm saying a lot of the same things and people said oh when you said that I really heard it It it's like I'm you're always in class is that the first time you've heard that but it's really what you're ready to hear I mean Mm -hmm. I remember coming to to yoga and maybe a year and a half in I was like oh that's what this pose is called (laughs) like you've been here every day but it's just we're in our heads and there's so much going on and the more we drop in uh to our bodies and, and really actually embody ourselves it's amazing what you what continues to be revealed and that's what I love that's what hooked me in the beginning of this practice is there was so much revelation and stripping myself from from the dance world which so much of movement for me was about pleasing someone else Mm -hmm. winning a dance competition getting a good mark in the ballet exam it was like from this little tiny little thing in tights and bodysuit shivering at the bar all of a sudden becomes this like little robot performer her whole life and I step in 15 years later into a yoga class and the teacher's going how do you feel? What does this feel like in your body? Breathe, relax, don't push, don't overdo it. Like that narrative, I had not heard that narrative before. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, someone that was in her body all her life steps into a different practice. And I'm, I'm starting to trust myself for the first time. I'm starting to learn about myself. I'm starting to hear the voice in my head. I'm starting to honor instead of push and punish and so much of those lessons I just thought god if I just would have had this younger and that was the inception of girl bond it was exactly that if I just had this younger if someone opened a doorway for me to learn how to breathe deeper and and honor this vessel Whew, different different life but I'm so gr- grateful for for bringing me to that place so I can teach mm. 
Yeah, I I relate to that so much as a former dancer, to, as a dancer. I don't think you're ever really a former dancer. I remember when I when I went to school, I went to NYU to study dance, and I started taking modern dance after being like a super ballerina for my whole life. And my teacher saying, it doesn't matter what it looks like, it matters how it feels. So I'm going to tell you how each movement sh- can feel in your body, not even should feel. And it's like, here's how this can feel in your hip. And I'm really going for this feeling. And I don't care what it looks like. I'm just being like, does not compute. Like, what, what do you mean? I'm, I'm not used to, I'm just used to copying somebody else and not even thinking for myself. Just, I have to do exactly this and fit into exactly this way. And that's like, that's a total algorithmic change, you know, of your whole life to stop copying just what other people are doing because it looks right and to actually begin to feel things. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> It is. And then what that looks like off of the mat or out of the studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much of the staying in line and looking perfect, like all of that translated into friendships in school and that level of perfectionism I held so, so tightly. And then what it was to be in relationship to the messiness is actually what yoga gave me. It was like, Mm -hmm. be messy. And I was like, no, 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 no. (laughs) Don't, I don't want to do that. I don't know. And the exploration of the mess and the exploration of the emotion and, oh man, I was, yeah, it was so profound and still is. It's still constantly revealing itself to me. And all of those little old dance patterns like pick up where I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine, no, everything's fine. I'm like, okay, hold on. There she is. And just going back to her, like so much of this work is inner child stuff where I'm just like, okay, what what does she need? How can I take care of her? How can I tell her it's okay? It's a big part of it too. Yeah, I think this is where Gen Z has like really, <laughs> I don't know how they learned this, and like just know it in their cells, but they're, they're so, they seem so good at it, or like a lot of them seem really good at it. I even look at, you know, Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles and the fact that they're ad- self advocating for their mental health as these incredible athletes on like all the world stage and they understand how to prioritize themselves in relationship to others and not that it's selfish to do that, but that it's necessary. I don't know if I could make that choice. Like, I don't think I could make that choice, you know? No. (laughs) It's revolutionary. Revolutionary. They just changed the whole world (laughs) based off of those decisions. It's, I still, like, my whole body has chills. Like, I still can't get over it. I I caught a Simone Biles interview, like, right after she won, because she came back into the competition just to be, to like have a good she was like I'm just gonna you know get in there without the pressure and one bronze and and just to do something without expectation and for herself without anything to prove I think as a young person and still feel this way like oh there's always something to prove I still need to feel this external validation do people see me do I matter and it's like we're constantly searching searching and you know to to get out of that is I'm just like how who taught you that how did that happen (laughs) How do you know that? How do you to advocate in such a way on the truly the biggest world stage possible? What that's going to do to the sport, what that's going to do for young women, what that's going to do for young black women. Oh, my God. It's just, yeah, revolutionary is like the only word I can think of. It's just like true, true change. It is. And and also just the awareness of the intersectionality of being a person of navigating things like sexual trauma and abuse and racism and misogyny and also capitalism and being a pawn in those things and experiencing all of them and how that compounding pressure. I'm just so impressed that, that, that Simone Biles in particular has been able to articulate, like, here's everything that's up and it's a lot. And I'm not going to shy away from it and not talk about it just because it makes other people uncomfortable. This is the truth of where I'm at. And like what all these things mean. I love that we're moving into a world that has more nuance and complexity as opposed to these black and white either or perspectives of thinking of you have to be this or you are that. You can only have one thing wrong with you. It's so cool. And what it is to choose yourself. She said in the interview, like how she felt so much pressure and expectation, like 
if she wasn't happy, the rest of the team wasn't happy. How her mood and her, how she showed up was really impacting everyone else and how much pressure that felt like. And then what it is to to say, okay, well, if I'm this way, I, I'm responsible for me and you are responsible for you and I can't hold this all. And so I'm going to choose me. I mean, I think about that on a, on that sort of the macro level, on a micro level in relationship and friendship at work, all of these little places where we can choose ourselves and advocate first for ourselves and our mental health and, 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 and what that does, it, how that shifts our relationships. Cause at the end of the day, when we are boundary less or when we are doing things for others, those people are getting something from that. And so it's hard to, to get out of that with your mom, with your dad, your siblings or whoever we're in these sort of enmeshed relationships with. It's such a powerful thing to say, I choose me before anyone else. I am still always working on that con- daily. Same. Hourly. <laughs> Same. Same. <laughs> and I still really grapple with it of, of what's, I don't know about you, but the, the pendulum swing from being boundaryless to being like so hyper boundaried that I'm almost like rigid and finding that happy medium of trust between knowing that you can navigate both, right? You can ac- both accommodate people when you need to and also like advocate for yourself and your feelings and like, how can you be healthy about it? And I think that that's, that's the flux in between the two. But even when I hear Simone Biles talk, I'm like, oh, you're still like so young. Actually, I was talking to my husband about this because he was sort of painting the picture of him in college, like in Boulder and like he like never brushed his hair, like all of these things. And I was like thinking of me and my my friend reminded me that like for my birthday, my 21st birthday, we had like a Chanel cake. And I was just like, so I was, I was just like, ew, I grow. I was like, we probably never would have wanted to be together. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I just think that. Yeah, I'm just like, who was that? But she was doing her best. She was trying. Yeah, it's really sweet. That's really sweet. <laughs> oh, we didn't even talk about your classes that open, but they are just like this to me. They are so warm and real and grounded. And one of my pet peeves in yoga or meditation is when people have yoga teacher voice. And yeah. you have a real person voice. And I love it. And I think that's why so many of our cast members have a crush on you. It's because you bring this energy and it is Thanks. so nourishing and welcoming and different. And I'm just so grateful that you exist. Oh, thank you. That's a high compliment. And I want that to be the experience. <laughs> Coming into these practices is scary, especially with breath work. Like people are like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And mm-hmm. someone invited me and I got to take this thing at eight o'clock in the morning and <laughs> breathe through my mouth and so uncomfortable. And I get it. I'm a student of this practice too. And so I just want people to feel like I'm meeting them where they're at. And I think what we've done with open and the platform itself is so beautiful. I'm just like so proud of everything that we've created. And it's truly about how you, we called it open because it was like, can we create ritual where people open every day? And especially Mm -hmm. with breathwork, you're opening to your emotions, your mind, your body, your breath and, and, each other and it's vulnerable and it's incredible and it's so life-giving and it feels so just real is the word and connected and um that's why I said yes to joining the team and it's definitely far exceeded my expectations in terms of coming into everyone's home every morning it's a gift to be with people in that way big time well I mean yeah I can't say enough about the platform it is incredible and and I think so much of it, yes, the tech is beautiful and the neuroaesthetics are amazing, but the the gifted teachers are what makes it, you know. It could have the it could have the best music and the most beautiful <laughs> aesthetics, but if the content wasn't there, then who cares? And people like you and Minoj and George and Catherine are the reason that it's so phenomenal. So thank you. How can people find you and buy the book? Yeah, so you can find me at Ali Maz on Instagram and in my link tree, you can find the book. But the book is available everywhere books are sold. So I'm told in the U.S. it's definitely sitting on a Barnes & Noble shelf somewhere, but lots of independent bookstores too. And yeah, you can find me at Ali Maz and at Galvana Yoga. Thanks, Ali. Thank you.
Okay, and that's our episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. We appreciate it. We love you. And this month we are running a little contest. If you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast and send us a screenshot at the text line below, you will be entered to win one of our spell sweatshirts or any of our swag sweatshirts, really. So make sure that you enter. And, oh, my gosh, you're loving that we're talking about things like enclosed cognition and neuroaesthetics, and I'm so happy to hear it. Check out the reel that we just posted on Instagram. It seems like it's really resonating with people. That sounds so dorky. God, I can't believe I just shouted out a reel that I made. God, I'm, I feel like a loser. That's okay. It might be helpful for you. I don't know. The crux of it is we've been told that if you care about aesthetics and neuroaesthetics, we talked about it this in last Friday's episode, that it means that you're vapid and stupid, and it doesn't mean that. That's not true. You can care about beautiful things and how things look. And guess what? You can still be intelligent (laughs) and intuitive. Guess what? You can be creative and like things that are beautiful and be really good at business. You can be multiple things. Remember, we're talking about wellness and multiplicity over the next couple weeks and how we contain multitudes. So check that out. Maybe check that meal out if you're curious and do a Google on enclosed cognition and definitely stay tuned for this Friday's episode. I'm talking about archetypes and costumes and the, how the costumes that we wear impact the way that we interact with the world. So that's it. Thanks for tuning in. I love you so much. You're the best. I'll see you on the internet. Okay. Bye.